Before we get started, this video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. So, with the recent release of James Wan's Malignant, I felt an urge to go back and watch the Insidious films, but on the UK Netflix server, I only had access to the first and third film. So, to save some money on renting or buying the other two films, I discovered that the entire series was available on Netflix Canada, and since I'm paying for a Netflix subscription, why not get more out of what I'm rightfully paying for? That is the beauty of ExpressVPN. I simply connected to Canada from a list of over 100 countries, and ExpressVPN tricked my internet into thinking that's where I was, thus bypassing obnoxious geographical restrictions, so when I refreshed my Netflix page, I instantly had access to that entire country's catalogue. For less than $7 a month, ExpressVPN is here to give you unrestricted access and freedom to the internet while retaining your privacy. Without ExpressVPN, it's like going to your favourite restaurant and only being allowed to pick from the starter menu, and several of those options are now unavailable because you took too long to order. ExpressVPN has received rave reviews from many tech critics who know far more than I do, and along with fast internet speeds and 24-hour friendly customer support, you'll be able to consistently dominate download and stream your favourite content with little issue. So find out how you can get 3 months free by visiting expressvpn.com slash Ryan and unlock more value in all your streaming services. Tragically, Dan O'Bannon's 1985 cult classic The Return of the Living Dead is the one zombie movie I always seem to forget despite arguably being one of the best in the genre, or at the very least one of the earliest examples of a zombie flick that subverted what was iconic about them at the time. It wasn't just the fact that it established the concept of mouthy zombies moaning for brains and could also run, but frankly, the fact that they were practically unkillable was just as terrifying as it was hilariously surprising. The brain! The brain! I hit the fucking brain! I remember watching Return of the Living Dead on late night TV a few times as a kid and being kind of confused by it. For the longest time, I always thought it was a very belated and bewildering sequel to George A. Romero's Knights of the Living Dead, and looking into it, it turns out there's a clear reason why. In his 2010 book detailing the production of Night of the Living Dead, Joe Kane explained that George Romero and his co-writer John Russo agreed to split the rights to the film, allowing Romero to make his own sequels, while Russo could use the title Living Dead for his own projects, leading to his own 1978 novel Return of the Living Dead, after failing to adapt it as a sequel to Romero's original masterpiece. What you doing in there? I don't know, it sounds so he did eventually sell the rights to producer Tom Fox, who then hired the Texas Chainsaw Massacre's Toby Hooper to direct an adaptation, but Hooper later dropped out in favour of making a really weird sci-fi vampire flick called Life Force. Instead, duties were taken over by that film screenwriter Dan O'Bannon, who rewrote the entire story to avoid direct comparisons to Romero's work, which was inevitably going to be the case, seeing as Fox had already received threats of legal action by Romero's associates a few years prior, due to the confusion surrounding his film Day of the Dead. The plot is pretty simple. One night, two medical warehouse employees accidentally unleash a toxic gas from a mysterious military tank that reanimates the dead, and soon after, while attempting to dispose of a zombie using the crematorium next door, all hell essentially breaks loose as the fumes erupt into toxic rain that brings the local cemetery back to life. Send more paramedics. What I always distinctly remember and love about the story is that it's unconventionally delivered as a domino effect of exacerbating circumstances instead of a traditionally structured plot. Without spoiling anything, it is worth mentioning to those interested in watching the film after this video, Return of the Living Dead does come to a jarringly abrupt conclusion, but trust me, there is somewhat of a point to it that I will attempt to explain throughout the video. I guess the best way is to think of it more like a satisfying solitary extended prologue to where most zombie movies typically begin, by focusing on the outbreak itself compared to the now generic survival tales we've all become accustomed to. As always, as we go along, make sure to leave your thoughts and requests in the comments below, and while you're at it, let's dive into the world of Return of the Living Dead. 
Now, before we get into some of the plot details, I do want to address the overall style, because, as I said, the most distinguishing feature I love about the film is how it rejects a traditional narrative arc in favour of this deflating balloon of mayhem. Broadly speaking, most zombie fiction by its nature is typically quite meandering. We see humans trying to survive against unstoppable killing machines, only for things to inevitably fall apart because of humanity's inability to find peace and put their complacency and selfishness aside. You know, zombie storytelling 101, humanity is its own weakness, etc, etc. Send me a However, the thing is, while Return of the Living Dead may not be commentative by any means, at least not in the same way Romero's films were, it did manage to highlight the inherent nihilism of the genre, and the general lack of resolution and this acceptance to the new normal. You think they'll rescue us? Oh, they better, man, that's all I gotta say. But do you think they will? <laughs> When you go back to Richard Matheson's 1954 post-apocalyptic vampiric novel I Am Legend, which pretty much established the formula Romero himself was greatly inspired by, it became the quintessential timeless tale to set the tone for every similar story that followed. It called attention to this intense symbolism of life via the food chain, where humanity has comfortably accepted its position as the dominant force because that position has never really been challenged. While there was a long history of science fiction asking the question, what if there was something physically, intellectually, and even morally superior to us out there, the difference with Matheson's novel was that it dealt more with the human condition of being dethroned, and focused on a man who gradually comes to realise, but still struggles to accept, that humanity is gone and his species no longer reign supreme, tapping into our inherent arrogance. The story basically goes that the one thing to bring down humanity is itself, as the story conveys post-war nuclear tensions and this idea that one action can cost us everything as we take our fragility for granted, which ever since has been the point of almost every zombie movie, even if it is as seemingly inconsequential as brushing your arm against something that can kill you with a single bite. This place, everybody that comes in, Get swallowed up. No, I understand that is a lot to take in for a film that, at its very core, is a slapsticky comedy, but I lost sleep over this because my brain is still working overtime after covering The Machinist and even The Lost Boys, which even found a way to sneak itself into this video. Yet, there is no escaping the idea that the story is set up to be a genre satire that Shaun of the Dead has a lot to thank for, as it takes place in a universe where Night of the Living Dead was a real film based on real events that the government attempted to cover up, and thus the tanks the warehouse employees tamper with are supposedly the very evidence of those events. I thought you said if we destroyed the brain it'd die. It worked in the movie! Well it ain't working now, Frank. You mean the movie line? Like I said in the beginning, The Return of the Living Dead is written to be this rebellious antithesis to Romero's inadvertent popularization of the genre, by rejecting almost everything that had been established up to that point. Barely halfway into the story, it makes it clear we are in a potentially unwinnable scenario, and the sooner you accept that there really are no rules, or at least the rules we've come to know don't actually matter, it makes it a wildly unpredictable watch. The most noticeable aspect of the film is its heavy emphasis on a punk-like aesthetic that borders on cynically cartoonish. Man, what a hideous, ugly place. I like it. It's a statement. It helps to heighten the nihilism by projecting a kind of fuck you, shit happens and I deal with it type of attitude when it introduces its adorably silly gang of punk caricatures. I like death. I like death with sex. How about you, Casey? You like sex with death? Yeah, so fuck off and die. I think the fascinating dynamic between them is that their dialogue feels deliberately vapid and even overtly cliched even for its time. All they essentially talk about is partying, having sex and then dying as they dwell on their precarious and misunderstood self-obsessed demeanours, somewhat taking aim at John Hughes-style coming-of-age teen narratives at the time, while one specific character gets naked for absolutely no reason, other than to reinforce the point of their party-and-die lifestyle, and existentially fantasises over how she'll die. Do you ever wonder about all the different ways of dying? 
you know, violently. Some of you may have noticed I literally talked about all of this in my Lost Boys videos, so I won't regurgitate it too much, but as a summary, you once again have that teen slasher era symbolism of promiscuity having its association to death, which was fully brought to attention in Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street the year before. It plays right into that same romanticized rebellious image of teens having a deviant ritual-esque lifestyle where they give into their temptations, but at the price of their soul as their uptight parents parents and authority figures assume. Again, I know that sounds like a lot to digest for a comedy, but if you've been around this channel long enough, you know what you're in for. And the less I have to talk about this motherfucker, the better. Ah, that thing always makes me want to take a bath. So, early in the story, one of the warehouse employees, Frank, casually mentions to the new recruit, Freddy, that they ended up in possession with the secret military tanks because, lol, typical army screw-ups, establishing this cynical, apathetic perception we have of the military, compared to the overly stern shock and horror demonstrated in other zombie flicks. It knows its place and doesn't attempt to preach a moral lesson that hasn't already been covered time and time again, essentially consolidating the theme away from humans are the real monsters monsters to, hey, aren't humans really fucking stupid? It kind of works its way into the greater irony of the story by having the zombies trying to eat brains despite most of their victims either being clueless, stubborn, or flat out buffoonery. I mean, that Simpsons joke is basically done here without having to call obvious attention to it. Now, that's not to say there aren't smart characters here. Both the warehouse boss, Bert, and Mortician Ernie do try to hold things together, but the film still brilliantly taps into how humans are inherent fuck-ups, especially in times of pressure. We commonly make mistakes because we're overly emotional beings who act more out of impulse than rigorous logic. That's why I love the zombies so much. They're presented as both clever and composed compared to the rambunctious and chaotic nature of the human characters. It's a surprising rarity to what most other zombie and post-apocalyptic fiction would have you believe. You see, most stories have that one character who has their shit together and is unfazed by literally everything and so naturally inherits leadership, but that's not always the case, and I would like to think most of us relate more to the emotional train wreck happening here. Seeing humanity fall apart because of actual fear and confusion is tangibly instilled in the narrative, especially as the zombies aren't the slow, shambling, breed dead creatures creatures we're used to, they have strength, order, and intelligence that's unmatched by the protagonists. Hell, symbolically, the zombies are the true rebels of the story, unlike the whiny poser kids. They've come back to reclaim their freedom from being dead. It's now their time to party. And unlike the punks, they come with a purpose. Ironically, they have a true, vested interest in being alive, so to speak. Right, at this point, I have to address the harrowing tragedy of the story that seemingly comes out of nowhere, so I'm going to say major spoilers from here on out, so brace yourself. I said this before about the comedy horror severance, but there's a point where Return of the Living Dead just stops being a comedy when you realize how deflated and in despair the characters have become. By the end, all the energy is sucked out of it because, again, consistent to the zombie genre, it meanders about without little progress. At some point, you realize how aggressively overwhelmed the characters have become, and they've yet to do anything of meaning. However, here's the shocking twist. When they eventually interrogate a zombie, they discover that the zombies eat brains to relieve themselves of the perpetual pain of being dead. I can feel myself rot. Yep, that's right, they are suffering. All the never-ending agonizing screams throughout the film that characters like Frank and Freddy beg to end have a purpose. Both these characters even go through the painful process of death themselves when they inhale the gas early in the story, but while Freddy attempts to eat his girlfriend's brains, Frank euthanizes himself by climbing into the furnace to end his suffering. It is the one zombie movie where I'm left feeling genuinely sympathetic for the dead, and not just because they're silly or quirky. That context humanizes them because, well, they are human. They still experience feelings like we do. They're are no different, only worse by the fact that they cannot die. When you think about it existentially, that is some really heavy shit to consider. 
Now, Romero did actually attempt to do something similar to this in 2005's Land of the Dead by exploring the concept of zombies growing a conscience and taking back their home, which was somewhat hinted at in Dawn of the Dead and technically did exist in Night of the Living Dead as the zombies showed some form of self-preservation. Yet, in a sort of strange, paradoxical way, Return of the Living Dead does engage with the conclusion to Matheson's I Am Legend just as well as any other story that takes itself seriously. The zombies aren't villains, they were accidentally resurrected and are forced to adapt to their painful circumstances, which the humans feel to do. At the very end, Bert does contact the military and their response is to just nuke the town without question. It's a mess not worth cleaning up the hard way, yet all they do is just make everything worse by continuing the cycle towards the apocalypse. Return of the Living Dead was truly ahead of its time, even if it didn't mean to be, much like how Romero's Night of the Living Dead became the popular western template for zombies. It's a wickedly charming and silly situational comedy that slowly rots into a genuinely grotesque emotional overload where, by the end, all you want is for all the screaming to stop while, at the same time, wishing for the ghoulish party to live on.